Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple data points, use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. As always, Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor, is with us in New York. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So we have two data points for you this week. In the second half of the show, we're going to be talking about the economics of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher. So stick around for that. But first, we have another data point for you, and that is one, as in number one, on the Billboard 200 album charts, which is the position that Beyonce's latest album, Cowboy Carter, held for two weeks upon its release in late March. It debuted with 407,000 albums in its first week, and that makes it Beyonce's eighth number one album on the Billboard 200. She's the most Grammy-nominated artist of all time. But her Cowboy Carter album has already ignited a larger conversation in the country community. The first black woman to top the Billboard country chart. But as Queen Bee herself says, this ain't a country album. It's a Beyonce album. Beyonce is obviously the biggest pop star in the United States alongside Taylor Swift, who has since taken that number one slot on the Billboard 200. Yeah, we thought, though, we would dig into the economics of Beyonce's particular pop stardom. Adam, to start off, I I saw that Swedish policymakers, um, I realize that's a funny thing to cite at the beginning of a segment on Beyonce, But yeah, so Swedish policymakers referred to the macroeconomic effects that Beyonce's tour caused in the country, uh, including an uptick in inflation. Apparently, that's also evident in the local economies of the United States whenever uh, her tour passes through town. And I'm curious if you could describe how this so-called Beyonce bump works in practice. (laughs) Yes, it really is. It's it's an extraordinary turn of events. Well, basically, as far as I understand it, her tour... World Tour starts in Stockholm in May, and she's there for two nights, and they've sold out all 46,000 tickets um, each night. And Stockholm is a lovely city, but it has limited hotel supply and Airbnb supply. And so the prices of those and restaurant meals and everything else that goes with a great night out have just gone through the roof. And so think of it as a kind of reverse COVID effect where you know everyone stopped going out and the prices for all of those services fell. In this case, everyone wants to have a good time. And go and see a great show and so faced with limited supply prices surge you you would expect people having blown their fund budget for the year or the month to then pull back and so this you would expect this to be a temporary effect except that and this is the fascinating thing except that the swedish central bank is in fact one of the last central banks globally to raise interest rates and so they are pursuing a relatively accommodatory monetary policy their interest rates are relatively speaking lower and the Swedish krona is relatively lower. And so part of the of the Beyonce bump story actually has a macroeconomic dimension, which is that the Swedish krona is undervalued. So if you are an affluent Beyonce fan and fancy seeing her somewhere other than Vegas, for instance, uh, Stockholm all of a sudden turns out to be a great place to go because translated into dollars, the tickets go for between 60 and $140. It's a steal, right? So there's a macroeconomic effect, which is compounding the simple supply side story of there not being enough hotel rooms. Whereas, you know, the standard tickets on Ticketmaster for her Vegas show varied from 91 to $689. And there are many US cities where the resale price is multiples of that. So you're seeing a macroeconomic effect, in other words, the maladjustment of interest rates, the relatively higher uh, inflation rate, the relatively lower value of the Swedish krona, compounding, producing a global effect, where, as it were, thousands of fans from the rest of the world flock to Stockholm to see this. And it's not simply a demand and supply story locally. You would expect this surge in prices ultimately to ebb away. Okay, got it. So there won't necessarily be a run on the Swedish currency uh, caused by Beyonce. On the contrary, no, people are running into the currency to get tickets because the tickets are sold in kroners. So essentially, she becomes tantamount to a tourist attraction in Sweden. In other words, she's an export. She's a service export for the days that she's in in Sweden. This was a little bit the same when Taylor Swift was in Singapore. There was a similar effect there. There was a whole geopolitical wrangle because no one else in Asia got a or well, Southeast Asia got a got a gig, whereas I think she's also playing in several European capitals. So this latest album of Beyonce's Cowboy Carter, 
as the name suggests, is a country album, which is a shift in genre for Beyonce. And that has stirred some controversy because she has, you know, quote unquote, crossed over into a genre that had uh, otherwise ostensibly been a white genre. This may be responsible for the success of the album, but it's also triggered, you know, some widespread discourse about this shift. And I'm, I'm curious how separate or intertangled white and black economies are today in the United States. I mean that both in terms of culture, but also just more generally. Well, many American cities in particular are still highly segregated and the northeastern cities, New York and Boston and so on, amongst the most severely segregated in terms of residential where people live and the local economies that go with that. There are completely different structures of retail and food deserts in many black neighborhoods across America's cities. The average, the median um, household wealth of of black Americans is as little as 24,000 by comparison, the medium white household has assets of 189,000. So that's a $164,000 difference. That implies some really stark differences between what you're calling black and white economies. If you go to the average rather than the median, the wealth gap is even huger. It's like 840,000, which reflects the fact that extremely affluent people like Beyonce and Jay-Z are much rarer in the black community in the US than in the white community. But in the music business, it's a bit different. Right, Because when we say that she's crossing over to a white segment like country, we shouldn't imagine that that means that somehow Beyonce is finally accessing the great you know, uplands of white music demand. Because the segment that she is the queen of, R&B, hip hop and so on, is by far and away, by any metric, the biggest segment in the global music business. Depends on which particular you know, streaming mechanism that you that you that you monitor, but broadly speaking, you know, you're not too far off if you say its share of overall music revenue flow is about twenty five percent, and no other genre comes close. In albums, old school albums, rock music still features, and in the purchase of streamed songs, country is a little bit further ahead. But in every other respect, R and B dominates country by a factor of two to one, which given the fact that the black population is a relatively small minority of the of the total population of the United States, about half that music share tells you that she's already crossed over to white America on a gigantic scale, right? This country move, I think, is a sort of, I can do anything kind of a move. It's a sign Beyonce, as she said about the album, this isn't a country album, this is a Beyonce album. I'm just making a album any way I like, and I can, because I am who I am. I am this multi-talented, fabulous, extraordinary performer and talent and also brand. And so she can she can break this. And I think she's in a sense taking up the challenge that was laid down by the frankly racist reaction to her appearance at the CMAs in 2016, when she appeared along with the Dixie Chicks and provoked a bunch of, you know, of white kind of idiotic backlash. Um, and she's also appropriating the legacy of black music, which is so diverse and has you know crossed over and influenced so many different aspects of American musical culture. And she references some um, Linda Martell, who was a was a big crossover black artist, I think, from the early nineteen seventies. And she's explicitly, if you like, owning this this connection. And of course, she's a woman from Texas and her mother's family comes from Louisiana. So she comes, she's deeply of the South. And in a sense, as a black woman from the from the South is simply claiming this as part of her legacy as well. She's from Houston, which, you know, which has a, a famously sort of crossover scene of rodeo and black culture and hip hop and country. And so I think she's simply making that kind of a statement. So among other things, Beyonce is also undoubtedly a kind of icon of activism social activism, feminist activism, and broadly speaking in those ways, economic activism. But I'm curious whether her career also shows the, the malleability of the content of feminist or, or social activism. Uh, I mean, it seems to me her image has changed multiple times, you know, as pop stars' images necessarily do over the years. In her case, she's gone from a kind of proud underdog figure, it seems to me, to an unembarrassed material success to uh, a scorned lover, to, you know, occasionally even a nostalgic for, for past tough times that she's overcome. And yeah, I guess I'm just curious, you know, what, what does this reveal about what it means to be empowered, to use that activist term? Does that, does that change over time? 
Yeah, the more I thought about this, the more kind of hilariously inappropriate I thought it was for me to comment. But uh, let, let me let me give it a shot anyway. I mean, you know, if you take the outlines of her biography, which was all news to me, but it was totally fascinating. I mean, her great 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 grandmother was a slave. Her great great grandmother was the Creole mistress of a white plantation boss. Um, her dad was a graduate of Fisk, an up and coming Xerox salesman, and her mother, a multi talented performer who you know, ran a hair salon in prosperous Houston, Texas. And if you look online, and I have, but, you know, Beyonce's family home, she lived in a beautiful house, as far as I'm able to tell, in in the third district, is it, or third ward of Houston? So really what looks like an extremely prosperous neighborhood. She herself then starts as like an extremely highly trained, as far as I can tell, talent show contestant. And then, as you say, she becomes one of the world's wealthiest self-made women with an estimated net worth of $800 million and counting. But what I think is very interesting, and this I really I found fascinating, was the trajectory in terms of her overt politics, because it's really after 2008, really in the 2010s, that she moves towards making much more explicit political statements. And it reveals a kind of relationship between black pop culture and politics in the US that I had only sort of dimly sensed. But I didn't know that the phrase woke actually was coined and put into general circulation, not by Beyonce, but by Erica Badu, the, the R&B luminary, a more outside artist figure than Beyonce, who had this um, master teacher song that was released on the you know extraordinarily politically named New America Part One Fourth World War album that was released in 2008. And she coins this phrase, I'm known to stay awake, a beautiful world I'm trying to find even though you go through struggle and strife to keep a healthy life, I stay woke, I stay woke. And that becomes the kind of mantra. And apparently it goes back to a, a moment in a Spike Lee film where he says, wake up, right? And it's this the school days film. So I think, and I hadn't really understood this, this merger between, because we now associate woke politics with sort of campus politics, but it comes out of an when you think about the word, it fits more naturally in a black American idiom. I didn't, I don't know that Cardi B, like Cardi B of WAP, right? Cardi B is a political science obsessive who's obsessed with American presidents and has a crush on FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt. Anyway, this is a whole crossover scene I had you know, zero awareness of until we started looking at this. But if you look at Beyonce's history, like um, she embraces feminism overtly in 2014. There's an appearance where she has a kind of feminist and I am a feminist as the central statement of her position, which opens up that term, which is so heavily freighted for many American women, especially perhaps black American women as a moment of something that they too can struggle with and think through and make their own. Then in 2016, she has the Dixie Chicks appearance, which matters because the Dixie Chicks in the country scene were the all girl group that, or then girl group that challenged uh, Bush over the 2003 war and, and uh, faced a lot of backlash for that. Then in the 2016 Super Bowl appearance, Beyonce makes all of these Black Panther references. And then in 2017, following on the football theme, she's one of the most prominent backers of the exiled ex San Francisco quarterback Colin Kaepernick, who has this you know, this campaign of taking a knee in honor of the Black Lives Matter um, movement, which became hugely contentious. And Beyonce is a fairly solidly paid up member, really, then of the liberal. She supports Hillary Clinton in 2016. You know, she, in fact, if you look at her numbers, her polling numbers, she's one of the most politically divisive figures in American public culture. But it is a, it's a phenomenon that isn't just her, but has something to do with an increasing sense of the urgency of the question of racial injustice in the United States, which just comes to the fore in a new way in the 2010s and has a rallying force. And in, in her case, of course, or in the case of Erica Badu, whatever, a huge charisma that charges this with an energy that, you know, it's hard to think of any white artist in the same period that could carry the same, that could carry the same weight and impetus and makes her a, a strange kind of feminist icon in many ways for so many women around the world. Yeah, I guess this leads uh, to the last question I wanted to ask, which is basically, is Beyonce supposed to be relatable at all? You know, we're, we're talking about pop stars here. And, you know, is there a level of stardom that one can ascend to where the nature of the fan's relationship to the star, to the icon, ceases to be about relatability? It seems like fans are not trying to relate to the star anymore in terms of that kind of 
personal relationship? <laughs> I really, I, I thought the previous question was one that like challenged the boundaries of like you know ability to relate, and this one like took me so far. I have no idea whether Beyonce is relatable because I'm pretty confident that middle-aged white British dudes are not the demographic that she is most directly, most directly appealing to. In fact, it's obvious that that's not the case, right? I mean the what you might think of as being the central issue here is just her immense wealth. I mean, she and Jay-Z, I mean, he's apparently, because of his business deals, not from his musical success, which is minor compared to hers, but his business dealing make him like somebody who's worth like 2.5, 2.5 billion, which catapults them as a couple into like the super class of not the very top end who are 20, 30, 40 plus billionaires, but into the uber elite of American society and in black society, along with a bunch of other entertainers and some tech entrepreneurs and people in finance into an extremely selective group. Whether that's still relatable, I'm really the wrong person to ask. You know what I did? I Googled, is Beyonce relatable? I actually just Googled this and I found an answer. And take it, you should not listen to me. You should take it, you should listen to the person that I found, who's this YouTuber called T Noir. So that's T-E-E Noir as in French Noir. And she has this astonishing, I mean, really forget it, knock out, knock down, drag out, eloquent, hilarious commentary on why she doesn't think Beyonce is relatable. It's like this, she has, she has a huge following on YouTube. Congrats. Cause she's, she's very powerful cultural critic, 650,000 plus followers. And she gets so deep into this in ways I couldn't possibly understand. But the basic message is what she calls the black billionaire paradox. Now, what does it mean that you have people like Beyonce who will appropriate the iconography of radical black politics, like in the in the Super Bowl show, and yet also appear in a Tiffany advert in which she is literally celebrated as the first black woman to publicly wear the Tiffany diamond. Like, you know, what is this? What sense do we make of this? And seriously, go listen to her. Stop listening to me. She has a lot of very powerful things to say about this and is certainly somebody who, she's apparently a fully paid up Beyonce. I thought they think they're called beehive or bayhive right from beyonce be queen bee anyway she's this is somebody that actually has an opinion worth listening to on this point it's it's an extraordinary leap of fantasy in any case right that that folks can identify with this kind of glamour this extraordinary talent as well i mean you know her, her voice is 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 remarkable without wanting to make invidious comparisons with other highly successful pop stars Beyonce can sing. Fair enough. In any case, uh, we can leave the conversation here for now, but we will be back in a second to talk about the economics of Immanuel Kant. Hi, and welcome back. After that segment on Beyonce, we're now going to shift to talking about someone who uh, is sometimes referred to as the Beyonce of German idealism. That is, of course, Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher from the 18th century who just celebrated his 300th birthday a couple weeks ago. So that's the data point, 300. And we thought we'd dig into what Kantian economics might look like. So Kant uh, is more associated with ethics than economics generally, and above all, a kind of understanding of freedom that is pretty far away from what I think of as the standard economic understanding of freedom. So Kantian ethics is famously deontological. That's, you know, the word we used to use in undergrad philosophy classes, and basically that means just there's an emphasis placed on the absoluteness of moral duty. That's the, you know, the essence of freedom in Kantian ethics, uh, the duty that one bears towards others. Obviously, that doesn't seem to have much overlap with, you know, individual preferences and desires, the sort of thing that is at the heart of economic freedom, at least in standard economic theory. So, Adam, I'm curious, is there any way that how economic theory tends to talk about freedom could include Kantian ethics with its emphasis on duty? Is there any way that that could be used to inform economic theory? So this is a really tricky question, and I'm unlike our producer, I'm, I'm no philosophy major, um, so I'm going to like find some shortcuts into this. I always think there's two different ways of approaching Kant. 
One is through his ethical theory, that's the philosophical high road, and the other somewhat easier approach to Kant is via his thinking on politics and history. And so if we start there the, with the easy route, if you're looking for the influence of economics on Kant, I think the crucial thing to do is to not think in terms of modern economics, but to think of economics as Kant would have known it before really there was anything quite like modern economics. And the economics, however, that he would have encountered would have been so-called Scottish Enlightenment. So the big name here is Adam Smith, Adam Ferguson. These are people that are teaching above all around univer uh, the University of Edinburgh. And that stuff we know Kant really imbibed. So Kant was an enthusiastic reader of Adam Smith. He read his Theory of Moral Sentiments, which came out in 1759, and his Wealth of Nations that came out in 1776. And the influence of those texts and Scottish Enlightenment visions of history on Kant's thinking about history and politics, which really becomes public from the 1780s onwards. Kant's kind of done with some of the heavy lifting on his ethical system at that point, and he becomes a bit of a public intellectual. And so from the 1780s, he starts publishing on a variety of themes that culminate in his famous essay on perpetual peace in the 1790s. And in those texts, you see the influence of the Scottish Enlightenment very heavily. So what does this mean? Scottish Enlightenment uh, were, were kind of the progenitors both of modern thinking about economics and history in the sense that the sort of stories they like to tell was how what they called commercial society, not yet capitalism, commercial society developed, uh, urbanization, trade and commerce, the division of labor. If you think about the Scottish intellectual class in Edinburgh, their problem is how do we escape Braveheart, like a bunch of guys running around in kilts being wild and Celtic? And how do we become a civilized society in a great city like Edinburgh? Well, the Scottish Enlightenment economics is going to tell you how you got there. And Kant loves these kind of stories. In fact, he takes a slightly tougher version of these stories than some of the Scottish Enlightenment folks who were quite given to rather happy providential accounts for Kant. He's often called an idealist, but he actually likes tough stories. At one point, refers to his projects for politics as legislating for a race of devils. In other words, he wants theories of politics which are proof against the possibility that humans are actually naturally unsociable rather than sociable, and what would force them together. And he sees in Scottish thinking about trade, about urbanization, about the development of skill and productivity, an answer to that question. He particularly likes Adam Smith on the division of labor and you know the famous story about the pin factory. But for Kant, and indeed even for Smith, there's a passage in one of Smith's texts where he describes the possibility of an emergence of a society which was so sophisticated that somebody might actually have the time to dedicate themselves entirely to philosophy. And this is a story that Kant really likes, unsurprisingly, because it's like a history of himself emerging as a modern philosopher. The influence of Smith in the German world became quite pervasive, in part through Kant. So one of um, Kant's closest associates, Krauss, a longtime companion, becomes a real fanboy of Adam Smith and in the 1790s produces the first really widely read German translations and commentaries on Smith. And this matters because it's Smithian inspired economists who, after the collapse of the Prussian state faced with the Napoleonic invasion in 1806, begin the reform, begin rebuilding Prussia, which had been a classic absolutist state under Frederick the Great, into a more liberal, open law-bound state, still a monarchy, but based on liberal notions. And the anchor of that is the freedom of the market and the freeing of the serfs. And there's a distinctly Smithian impetus here. So through Kant, by way of Adam Smith and Krauss to the Prussian reform, there really is a story here of a deep influence. So that's one line, quite real. The other line, I think, is far more challenging which is what we would say if we imagined a modern theoretical Kantianism facing a modern theoretical economics. And, and this is really challenging, and it goes to the basis and the premises of modern economics, because the modern economics assumes the value and the primordial priority of individual choice and individual rationality. And that's exactly what Kantian thought bites on, not because it doubts the significance of the emergence of the individual, but because it asks the question, the deep question of how do we know about this individual and their knowledge and their preferences, right? Kant gets this in part from the skeptics, also in the Scottish school, people like Hume, who ask the question, how do we know that we know? How do we know that we want? And the answer, of course, is for Kant at least, is that there isn't really any empirical way of knowing this. We have to posit it. And it's that positing that gets him called an idealist. 
because an idealist doesn't presume that we can somehow just induct the reality of the world, but we have to we have to posit it. And the force of this, when applied to economics, is that it requires economics to actually become aware of its underlying idealistic assumptions. And not in a bad sense, I mean in the sense of actually just taking sort of stock of how far my assumption that the utility function is somehow the ultimate driver of choice models is founded on anything other more than a prior choice on my part to model the world that way. What is the grounds of that is something that Kant forces us to face, right? He's forcing us to ask the question, how do we know what founds the individual? And I think in this sense, Kantianism could be understood. It's a rather, I think, optimistic project, but it could be thought of as a really positive complement, a really challenging complement to the conventional assumptions of modern economics and the premise they have of centering their idea of knowledge or preference of choice on the individual. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned also Immanuel Kant's essay, Perpetual Peace, which was one of his works on political thinking. And yeah, I was thinking about that essay too. And, you know, it struck me that the German idealists of Kant's time, they seem to have opposing views on the role of commerce in international politics. In that essay, Perpetual Peace, Kant seemed to argue that trade was a precondition of international peace. And then at the same time, Kant's near contemporary, uh, the philosopher Johann Fichte, He was pretty much arguing the opposite, basically, that a closed commercial state was a better guarantor of of international peace. So this was a debate happening among German idealists in the early 18th century. And if you look at that debate, Adam, who do you think had the better of the argument? It is a really interesting dimension of 18th century thought that they were already cognizant of and already thinking quite hard about the way in which modern economics and the, the business of trade and development which was happening before their eyes as Europe emerged from the early modern period in the 18th century, would impact on politics and would impact on international relations. And Fichte is not the first, but perhaps the most radical in arguing that trade connections should not just be slowed, but should be rolled back so as to limit what Hume earlier in the 18th century had referred to as the jealousy of trade. So one way of thinking about trade is it creates connection and it creates stability and it creates, therefore, an incentive against war. Uh, But the other way of thinking about it is that it creates the incentive for imperialism and it inspires the jealousy of trade. Why is somebody else growing rich? Why are we not growing rich? What is the risk that arises if they go rich? Questions which we know only too well from our current moment. And Fichte argues in a radical way that the only way to ensure a perpetual peaceful order would be to cut trade off, therefore, and as it were, dial back these interconnections. Kant, on balance, and he's no simple-minded thinker on this, I think believes the opposite. In other words, that trade will, generally speaking, bind states together and therefore reduce tension. He's not overly committed, though, to an optimistic and sanguine view of economic development as a driver of peace. You you could argue the opposite. Um, Along with trade and international trade and and empire, which went with it, and slavery, of course, is a key element of that trade flow, um, the other development, the modern economic development of the 18th century was, was finance, state finance, sovereign debt. And Kant is radical in his Perpetual Peace essay of 1795 in arguing for an abolition of public debt as the condition for peace. Why? Because what do states contract debts for? It's not for welfare spending in this period uh, or for public works on a large scale. It's for fighting wars. And the 18th century had seen debt fueled wars on a huge scale, which culminated in the American Revolution and the French Revolution, which were the refusal of taxpayers, if you like, to carry the burden of those war debts. And Kant thought, why don't we just cut this off at the chase and simply abolish public debt, in which case states would really not be able to wage war because they would have to tax their citizens as they waged war, which would make wars very unpopular. So that you would not just have to levy recruits, you would have to levy taxation as well, which would cut off the dynamic. I mean, arguably, you could say that if one wanted to kind of make a philosophical play on this question, you know, whether Kant or Fichte got it right, you could say ultimately it was Hegel that did, in other words, the philosopher of history rather than simply of, of ethical positions. And and history, I mean that in the sense that history would in fact decide this question in, in rather in a rather brutal way, because Fichte's idea could easily be dismissed as a fantasy. But after his defeat of Prussia in 1806, Napoleon proceeds to Berlin and in Berlin in that autumn declares the continental system, which is a gigantic closure of the European continental economy against Britain. The idea is to destroy the British 
war making capacity by cutting off their exports in a sense a fichtian argument right but now deployed in france's interests against its great rival the british empire and the consequence of that effort to close trade was not pacification or smothering of the british empire but an escalation of the war between france and britain starting with the peninsula campaign against portugal and spain in 1808 which is uh, napoleon's attempt to close the system close europe against british trade and then most dramatically in 1812 that the trigger for war between napoleon and russia is not just Napoleon's kind of mania for conquest, but in fact, the refusal of Russia to any longer participate in the continental system. And so you could argue, if you like, that history spoke its judgment that the relationship between trade, closing trade and war is ambiguous, dynamic, it changes over time, all of them kind of Hegelian themes. And Fichte finds himself and by 1807, 1808, no longer speculating about a utopia, if you like, of closed down international trade and peace, but instead as one of the great orators of an emerging German patriotism against Napoleon. So his lessons, his, his lectures to the German people become canonical statements of an early uh, 19th century popular nationalism or elite nationalism, rather, I should say, in the struggle against Napoleon. Okay, so then Hegel, we could say, though, is the more salutary example of of thinking on this question. Yeah, so rather than trying to devise systems which rule war out, and that is the way we achieve progress, Hegel's rather grim alternative is to think war as a driver of progress. So it's uh, you know it incorporates the violence rather than trying to design abstract systems which contain and suppress it. And then, though, ultimately, Hegel comes around to, to defending the, the Prussian state as a representative uh, of some kind of political ideal then. Yes. I mean, both Kant and Hegel did. I mean, the Prussian state's a very ambiguous, I think, ideal for both of them because it remains monarchical. But Kant's essay writing on perpetual peace is directed at the Prussian state, not an abstract state. It's about trying to broker a bargain between... The Prussian monarchy, which was thought of as in the wake of Frederick the Great, the most enlightened version of monarchy that was out there, and the new republican regime that's emerging in France in the 1790s after the terror, which ends in 1794, the regime moves into the directorate. We have Sies, um established as, as one of the leading figures of this new regime, which will ultimately spawn Napoleon and a new wave of war. But in the mid-1790s, it appears as though there's the possibility of a peace deal. So Kant's famous perpetual peace essay, which in international relations theory is taught as the origin of idealism, was in fact a of the minute, of the moment, highly concrete, specific proposal for a deal between the Prussian state and the French. And Hegel later on will go on in various ways, and it's ambiguous in him too, to describe the Prussian state that emerges from its destruction at the hands of Napoleon as again a vehicle for progress. So we can think of both of them as, you know, at the one time thinking at very high levels of abstraction, at the other time, at the other moment, also trying to engage their thought with reality, with historical change, and certainly seeing in Prussia at all times a vehicle for progressive change. Not the most powerful by any means. Prussia really wasn't. We shouldn't conflate it with Bismarck's Prussia of the late 19th century. This Prussia was a second tier European player. But almost for that reason, it wasn't subject to the same massive pressures as the French monarchy or the British Empire and could become a vehicle for a more progressive kind of development. Well, yeah, you know, ultimately, I guess, as attenuated as the relationship between all of this uh, and economics might seem between Kant and Hegel and the world of economics, obviously, in some broader sense, Kant leads to Hegel, as you're describing. And then Hegel, of course, uh, leads to Karl Marx, who would not have been possible without these two preceding German idealists. And, and no one has ever accused Marx of not having a connection to economics. So there is uh, some economic connection here, although in some sense, yeah, it does strike me that Kant and Hegel, with their paradoxical Titan style of thinking that ultimately leads to some ultimate redemption of some kind or another. Maybe they're just ultimately deep down Lutherans, uh, good German Lutherans, which is ultimately is a Prussian quality as well. But yeah, we'll conclude our dipping of our toes into German idealism, at least for now. Maybe uh, there'll be another occasion to return to the subject. Uh, but in the meantime, I guess we can wish uh, Immanuel Kant a happy birthday, wherever he is, or, you know, Herzlichen Glückwunsch zu Geburtstag, uh, as one would say in German. Okay, see you all otherwise next week. <laughs>
Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Claudia Tady, Laura rossbrow Tellum, Rob Sachs, and Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Listeners to Ones and Twos even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TWOS at checkout. That's T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love getting your feedback. You can leave voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com or email us, podcast at foreignpolicy.com, or you can tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back in your feed next week. <laughs>